this equation is satisfied by uh, this ideal transformer where explicitly we have shown the direction of I2 and I3 going into that, into the target uh, terminals. And similarly, I1 prime going into the direct terminal. And uh, you can also see that I1 is the sum of uh, this um, I, I1 prime, uh, as well as this magnetizing component, I am one here. So you know, that is all satisfied. Uh, the next thing is that uh, we have to find out how is this I am one flowing? So here we know that uh, from Faraday's law, uh, E1 is N1 d phi dt, and uh, phi itself, if uh, only uh, side one is supplying the magnetizing current, so these are the ampere turns acting on the core because uh, nothing from side two and three, let's say they're open, are divided by the magnetizing, this uh, reluctance here. Okay, so now if we substitute this uh, phi sub m over here, uh, we can see that uh, E1 is equal to uh, this N1 squared divided by the reluctance times uh, di, di m1 dt. And uh, this quantity in the brackets is equal to the magnetizing inductance looking from side one. So we can place that magnetizing inductance over here. And this, this completes the, the equivalent circuit based on what we have discussed. But if you wanted to add the leakage inductances and uh, resistances of these coils, we can always place them in series over here. In series with these coils. So this brings us to the end of this uh, segment where we have looked at uh, magnetic concepts. Okay. So, so, so can they hear me? Yeah. So this is a very uh, quick explanation of how transformers work in uh, five minutes. And uh, to get this uh, concept across, uh, you know, it probably should take at least an hour and have some uh, problems uh, that should be solved because what's going on here is uh, you have a voltage perhaps coming from one side and you have the load connected on uh, other two windings or maybe it's just a two winding transformer. What's the direction of current? It will be all very different uh, than uh, what is shown here. Here we are for just uh, anal analysis purposes, assuming that all the currents are flowing into the dotted terminal. And uh, that's not what's going to happen uh, in a real transformer. And uh, so there's a lot to be desired here to, to have a good explanation. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and then go on to the next segment and uh, which is uh, magnetic design, this one here. In this segment, we will very briefly look at uh, the design of high frequency inductors and transformers. Uh, this can be a large topic by itself, but uh, we will just look at uh, uh, Look at, we'll discuss this in a very simple manner. Uh, so the basic of magnetic design is how to pick the peak flux density B max and how to pick this current density J max. So a lot of the discussion that goes on in designing these uh, uh, magnetic components really uh, depends on uh, how intelligently to select this uh, B max and Gmax. Uh, so let's look at, uh, in a very general term, uh, an inductor and a transformer. Inductor on the left and uh, a transformer with uh, secondary windings on the outside, let's say at, uh, at lower voltage and therefore high currents, and then the primary winding uh, on the inside here. So we have uh, this uh, window area uh, in both cases, and uh, we also have uh, for each conductor, we have this uh, conductor area and uh, this cross-sectional area of the core to, uh, through which the flux will pass. So uh, 
in designing these uh, inductors and uh, transformers, uh, one of the ways uh, is uh, called area product method. So this area product method, uh, to use that, uh, we will first uh, uh, calculate the window area. And uh, as you can see, that uh, this uh, win window area here uh, is equal to uh, uh, this uh, number of turns for uh, any winding, uh, let's say uh, winding Y, which is uh, NY, and the cross-sectional area, which is given by the, uh, this, exp this uh, variable A conductor for that winding Y, and we'll integrate over Y number of windings, and if you divide this by uh, this KW here, so that's uh, equal to, uh, KW is the window fill factor. We cannot fill this window completely. So this factor may be you know, somewhere in the range of 0.4 of 0.5. So that gives us the required window area. And then uh, in a, uh, this uh, conductor cross-sectional area depends upon the RMS current that uh, this winding Y has to carry and J max. And we'll assume this uh, current density to be max, the same maximum current density to be true in all windings, okay. So you can see here that uh, uh, if you substitute for this uh, conductor cross-sectional area over here, the window area required is given by this expression over here. So now what is the, and the, uh, so now we come to the co core cross-sectional area. How much should be that? And that, as you can appreciate, is the maximum flux that we need uh, uh, this circuit would have and divide by whatever we select as the maximum flux density here. So for an inductor, the maximum uh, flux would be L times the peak current uh, divided by the number of turns in that inductor. And therefore, substituting this for peak flux, the, the, the core cross-sectional area required is given by this here. Now, in a transformer, it depends upon what kind of a converter circuit this transformer is connected in. So let's say that uh, this, uh, the waveform for the voltage that appears on one of the windings, let's say winding one, so the voltage that appears on uh, across winding one is shown like this over here. So as from this, you can appreciate that uh, the peak flux that will, uh, that this uh, transformer would see, let's say it starts with zero. And uh, so this peak flux here would be based on the volt seconds that we apply. So that uh, volt seconds would be equal to, in this case, this uh, voltage here, this, this time period T sub S, and the frequency, uh, this time period is equal to, uh, uh, our frequency is equal to one over the time period, uh, switching time period over here. And depending upon the, the nature of this uh, voltage waveform, we have this factor, let's call it K conversion. It depends upon the, uh, the converter in which this transform is connected. So it's basically it's uh, V1 times this uh, factor divided by Fs, they give us the, the volt seconds that is being applied, where the flux is uh, starting from, let's say, zero and going to some peak value over here. So we get this expression here. And uh, therefore, uh, just picking uh, one of the, uh, the windings in this uh, transformer, let's say winding Y, uh, we can write this core cross-sectional area uh, from uh, using this equation here, so put in the peak flux for winding Y divided by B max, we get this expression over here. Okay. So now uh, let's multiply uh, this uh, core cross-sectional area and the window cross-sectional area. So uh, we can see that this so-called uh, area product for an inductor would look like this. And it is equal to the inductance that we want and uh, the peak current the RMS value of that current that will flow through this inductor. And in the denominator, we have the window fill factor, a J max and B max. Now for the transformer, uh, we get this expression here uh, in terms of uh, 
the sum of uh, 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 volt amperes, and uh, and this is based on the fact that uh, you know V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2 uh, from Faraday's law. So uh, once we have calculated this uh, area product, we can go to uh, core catalogs and uh, core manufacturers very carefully list uh, these uh, area products. So we pick uh, a core that meets the area product that is needed in designing this, uh, these structures. And uh, once we have picked that core, uh, you know, of course it gives this area product, but it also gives the cross-sectional area and also the, uh, uh, sorry, it gives the cross-sectional area of that core as well. So uh, once we have that, uh, you know, once we have picked that core, you can calculate the number of turns. Let's say you're designing an inductor. You can calculate the number of turns based on the inductance that we need, the peak current that is specified uh, for which we are designing this inductor, divided by B max that we have selected, and the, the, the cross-sectional area of the score that we have picked. So once we have that, uh, we have the number of turns, then the, in, the inductor, this is missing here, that uh, the, the inductance that we desire is equal to uh, this n squared divided by the, the reluctance offered to flux path. And that reluctance uh, would be basically due to, let's say, an air gap that we cut in the flux path. If it's a uh, core with uh, distributed air gap, that's something different. But let's say that we need to put some air gap in the flux path, then we need to decide what this reluctance ought to be based on the inductance that we're looking for. So this uh, reluctance uh, is equal to uh, the, and assuming that uh, uh, perhaps all the reluctance is offered by this air gap that we cut in this core, not uh, by the magnetic structure. So this is equal to length of the air gap uh, divided by the air gap permeability and the core cross-sectional area over here. So from here, you can see that if you combine these two equations, where you substitute for R sub G from here, uh, we can calculate what the length of this air gap that we need to introduce in this structure. Uh, and uh, we have already calculated the number of turns. Uh, a core comes from the uh, core that we have picked of a desired, with a desired area product uh, and uh, the inductance that we want. And similarly, we can, uh, for a transformer, uh, calculate the number of turns that each winding should have. Uh, let's say winding Y here, based on the uh, core cross-sectional area that this core has and all the parameters we know it need, uh, we already have been specified. Uh, in doing so, we have totally ignored the thermal considerations and uh, they can play a very big part. So this is uh, just a, a first cut, this area product method, but a uh, lot more uh, considerations uh, need to be given uh, before the design is optimized. So this brings us to the end of the segment where we have, uh, you know, in a very s simplified manner, uh, looked at the design of uh, high frequency, frequency inductors and transformers using this area product method. Okay, there is a question about uh, uh, the role of inductance, uh, air gap in an inductor, and uh, uh, the desirability of no air gap in a transformer. So an inductor is where the energy is stored, and that energy is, is stored primarily in the air gap. So the, the core that you have, the window area that you have is to facilitate like a conduit for that uh, flux that ultimately flows through the air gap. And the uh, air gap is where the energy is stored and that uh, is what uh, dictates the, the reluctance of the structure which in turn determines the 
the inductance that we are looking for. So, so if you have a uh, uh, if you have an inductor uh, which has a very high permeability core, then uh, you know we must have some uh, air gap in it. The other option is, uh, which is uh, somewhat equivalent, is that you have distributed air gap, uh, you know, in the core itself, and therefore it has uh, low permeability and uh, and therefore the energy is stored in the core. Now, when it comes to transformer, uh, you know, the best, uh, you know, in most cases, what you're looking for is a transformer with as low uh, energy stored in it uh, as possible. For example, an ideal transformer is has no energy stored and it also has no leakage inductances. So that's what we are hoping. So for example, if you have a forward converter, as we'll see, uh, you know, we, we, would, we wish that there was no uh, energy stored. Magnetizing inductance was basically infinite and no energy stored. So that's uh, the big difference between inductors and transformers. So, you know, let's say a fairly involved topic of uh, designing of this high frequency uh, magnetic components and uh, Professor Robbins uh, has uh, covered that in our book, but uh, I don't think he intends to cover it in this course, but uh, and that's a subject by itself. Okay, so I'll leave it at that. And, uh, you know, given the amount of time we have, uh, let's, uh, yeah, okay. uh, no, uh, Professor Robbins' modules are also on cusp, so if yeah. anyone wants, they can yeah. Yeah. see. Yeah. So these modules that Professor Robbins has developed, uh, the videos, they are also on this CUS website, and you can take a look at it as your leisure. Okay. So let's go to uh, our last uh, segment of the day, uh, which, well, maybe it's not the last, okay. But uh, we go to, uh, t uh, which one do we go to? Uh, we get uh, power electronics. Yeah, so we just covered the high frequency magnetics, yeah, can go to 21, power right? This one here? Yeah. Right. And then. Right, right, right. See how far we go. Okay. Yeah. Or we so, can just skim through it and then go to. Uh, in this segment, uh, we will look at isolated switch mode DC power supplies, where we will focus on flyback converters and uh, forward converters. So if you look at the structure of this, uh, of any switch mode DC power supply, uh, we Generally, we have the utility input here, and uh, this we could use diode rectifiers or power factor correction circuits uh, that we have discussed to produce uh, DC. And uh, then this DC is chopped up and has passed through a high frequency transformer and then is uh, rectified, and there's a filter at the output to produce this output voltage over here. So by doing this and using an isolation transformer at high frequencies, uh, we get electrical isolation, which is uh, needed uh, in many applications. And uh, uh, also, uh, uh, you know, we, we must make sure that there is an isolation in the feedback path. So that is uh, not shown here, but maybe we can put uh, some isolation here. We must have uh, the input stage and the output stage isolated. So uh, these uh, converters uh, that are used in such uh, uh, isolated, uh, electrically isolated uh, uh, DC power supplies, uh, they can be classified as shown here, uh, flyback converters, uh, which are derived from buck boost that uh, we have discussed earlier, forward converters, which are derived by buck, and then full bridge, half bridge, uh, which are derived by uh, uh, buck DC or DC converters. So here we'll just look at flyback and forward. So let's begin with uh, flyback converters. And uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, they are derived from a buck boost. So on the top left, we see a circuit for a buck boost converter. Uh, where the inductor is rather explicitly shown by a winding on a core where even uh, some air gap is cut 
to make it an inductor. And uh, <clears throat> so what our role here is to turn this uh, bug boost into a flyback, which has electrical isolation. So what we'll do is we will put two windings on it, as shown here, and uh, you know, show the isolation between the input circuit and the output circuit. Uh, the, the input current uh, is clearly defined and the polarities of this uh, input winding is shown. Similarly, this output current is defined here, again, going into the dotted terminal. Okay, so quite commonly, uh, this uh, flyback converter is shown like this, uh, rather than what I have shown in uh, figure B, but I think figure B gives a very good idea of how uh, these uh, flyback converters work. So let's analyze this. Uh, let's say that initially, uh, we, we, if there's a flux in the core at time zero here, we turn this switch on, and what that does is causes this diode to get reverse biased. You can uh, follow the, uh, the voltage uh, that appears and say uh, in the reverse, it's in the reverse direction and it gets reverse biased. And once again, we'll assume that the voltage across the, the capacitor, this E0, is uh, pretty much a constant voltage. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so, so let's analyze the circuit. Uh, what's going on here is that uh, with this switch closed, uh, we are applying this uh, input voltage Vn across the primary winding of this uh, 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 the input winding of this flyback uh, transformer here, M1 terms here, and M2 over here. And uh, by applying this voltage here, this flux begins to ramp up linearly. And let's say the switch is closed for the, the duty, duty ratio here, here, D times the switching time period here. So uh, corresponding to this flux, that there is a current that has to flow in this uh, uh, input winding, and uh, this current uh, is plotted over here. It starts at this value, and it reaches this peak over here. So now, at uh, this instant of time, we turn off uh, turn off this switch, and uh, so let's see what happens here. Let's see if I can erase uh, all these things with. Uh, 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 yeah, I'm able to do that. So now we will. I turn off this switch over here. And uh, what happens then is that uh, because of, to maintain that flux, uh, the flux cannot change instantaneously, okay? So therefore, uh, the current has to flow into the dotted terminal and that flows through this diode over here, okay? So you can see here that uh, as soon as we turn off this switch, this IN drops to zero here, okay? But uh, if we ignore uh, all leakage inductances, this current I out, which was initially zero because diode was reverse biased, it jumps and uh, it reaches this value. And what that value is uh, can be calculated very easily because at this instant of time, uh, N1 times IN peak should be equal to N2 times I out peak here. Okay. So now, uh, this output current, I out, as defined here, jumps, and uh, we are applying this voltage uh, VO uh, in a negative sense across this coil. So the flux uh, in this uh, coil begins to ramp down to this value, and similarly, this I out from here ramps down to this value here. And then, uh, once again, we turn on the switch. That means DART becomes reverse bias. This current goes to zero, and the next cycle begins. Yeah. And it's in steady state, this value of flux is the same as this one over here, because the, the cycle is repeating from one switching time period to the next. And here we are assuming that uh, we are in incomplete demagnetization mode of this uh, core. That means uh, we we always have some flux in this uh, core here. Of course, we can uh, analyze it in a, a you know, second mode as well. Uh, so here we can say, uh, we can see here that uh, uh, during the switching time, uh, 
this doing this uh, switch on uh, the transistor on time. Uh, we are applying this voltage VN uh, for this many seconds. And if you divide it by the number of turns, and one that we are applying this voltage to, we get uh, this peak-to-peak uh, -peak, uh, ripple in the flux here. Uh, so delta V peak-to-peak -peak is given by this expression when the transistor is on, and it's given by this expression when the transistor is off. Because at that time, we are applying V0 in a negative sense, and this being applied to this many seconds, across this many turns over here. So we can equate the two because this value is the same as this value. So in both cases, we have this much excursion in uh, flux. And uh, from here, we can see that uh, the voltage ratio V0 over Vn is equal to uh, D over one minus D. So this is a familiar expression to us from, uh, and from having analyzed uh, buck boost converters but we also have this turns ratio here, N2 over N1. So uh, in uh, these converters, not only we get electrical isolation, which may be a very, uh, you know, which may be a requirement, but we can also adjust the, the output voltage that we get by uh, controlling the turns ratio. So we can analyze this thing in uh, detail using, uh, for example, a piece by modeling, where a snubber circuit like this RC circuit that we haven't discussed is needed because we have leakage inductances. And uh, this is to uh, satisfy a piece by requirement here. A very large uh, resistance of one mega ohm doesn't really change the circuit. And uh, we can see the, the waveforms here. I think uh, this green one is the current through this switch here, and uh, this uh, red one is uh, current through this uh, diode here on the, at the output uh, ID one here. Yeah. So this brings us to the next circuit that we will analyze in this segment, and uh, that is a forward converter. So these forward converters are derived from uh, buck converters. So on the upper left hand side, we see a buck converter. And uh, uh, to turn this into a forward converter which offers electrical isolation and the possibility of uh, uh, controlling the voltage magnitude uh, by turns ratio, uh, we see the circuit on the right hand side. And here we really uh, desire an ideal transformer if we can get it. But of course, there is no such thing as an ideal transformer. So uh, we need another winding here, uh, N3 uh, with the diode D3 here. But for now, uh, let us first assume that we have an ideal transformer, okay? So now what will happen is that uh, when we turn on this uh, switch here, uh, we are applying this voltage Vn across the, the input winding, which produces this N2 uh, across this uh, secondary winding, this voltage, and two times Vn. So let's plot this voltage Va as shown over here, okay? So when this uh, voltage is induced on the secondary side, this uh, D1 gets uh, forward biased, this uh, D2 gets reverse biased, and Va is equal to this value over here, all right? And uh, <clears throat> so now what we'll do is, uh, again, assuming the ideal transformer, if we turn this uh, switch off, this thing here, then the current through this uh, inductor, and assuming that this current flows all the time in the continuous conduction mode, then this current would flow with a free wheel through this diode, and uh, uh, so voltage across. Uh, these two terminals, this VA would be equal to zero. So we can see that, the, and then, uh, you know, we do this for a D ratio times the switching time period, and rest of the time the switch, uh, the transistor I should say is off. So over this time period TS, you can get the average of this waveform, this value here, and zero over here. So this average is equal to 
n2 over n1 times d times vn. So, uh, so that's the average of this V sub A, and that is also this average output voltage because uh, we know that in steady state, the average voltage across an inductor in these circuits is zero. So equating uh, this to the output voltage, uh, we see that the turns ratio, if I bring in Vn on this side over here, is equal to this here. And uh, you know we know from the buck converter that the voltage transfer ratio is just equal to the duty ratio in this continuous conduction mode. And uh, in addition, we have this, uh, uh, the, the turns ratio here. So now uh, we should look at the, uh, the requirement for uh, having this third binding that we need here. So again, we can see that uh, just to emphasize before we go on to the next slide, that we, we need a third winding with n3 number of turns, and uh, it is wound as shown and connected to a diode, through a diode to the input side here. So let's take a look here. And uh, so what we see is that when we turn on the switch here, we are applying this uh, Vn across n1 number of turns, and the flux, which must uh, start from zero in these uh, circuits, re uh, goes up to this peak value, let's say here, Vm. So that's happening during this interval of time. And when we turn this uh, transistor off, uh, this current here is freewheeling through here, and we want to make sure that uh, there cannot be a current in this path like this here. Okay, so we put this diode here, so that is not possible. This diode would block any current to flow through N2. So uh, because of this flux that has built up in this core, there will be a current I3 that will flow to this uh, diode. And, uh, the, and this voltage Vn would get applied to N3 number of turns in a negative sense, and uh, that uh, would cause this flux to ramp down to zero, and then the current I3 cannot reverse because we have a, a diode there, and uh, therefore it becomes zero here. So depending upon the number of turns we have in the primary N1 and the number of turns we have in the uh, demagnetizing winding here. Uh, we for this interval, corresponding to this interval, we'll get this uh, demagnetization interval T mag uh, during which this flux then ramps down. Uh, in general, and this, all this should happen within this uh, switching time period here. Okay, so uh, in general, uh, the, the number of turns uh, for uh, the, the input side winding and demagnetizing winding there the same, N1 and N3, that'll cause uh, this interval to be the same as this interval, and it will limit the, the D ratio of this uh, transistor to be less than 50%, okay? But that's uh, the general scenario here. Yeah, and some of the numerical waveforms are shown here. Uh, uh, for example, uh, you know, this V1 here, is 48 volts uh, uh, when the transistor is on, then it goes to minus 48 when the demagnetization current is flowing through D3. And this I1, uh, this current here is uh, being reflected from the output side, but it also has 0.5 amps peak of the magnetizing current I3. So those things are plotted over here. And uh, in this case, uh, it is assumed that N1 is equal to N3 here. So we can analyze uh, these circuits uh, using uh, piecewise, which is uh, done here. And here we see in green is the current through this diode over here. And in red, it is, uh, it's through here, demagnetization winding over here, this one here, right here, okay. A uh, very common topology for uh, higher power circuits is uh, two switch forward converters where we turn uh, both of these transistors on simultaneously, T1 and T2, 
and we apply this VN to this uh, primary winding. And uh, then uh, we uh, turn off these two transistors simultaneously. And uh, what that does is causes the, uh, the, the current through the, due to the flux in the score uh, to flow through D1 and D2 and uh, demagnetizes this winding here. And uh, so the operation is very similar. Uh, so when uh, these two transistors are on, uh, this current, the, the inductor current here flows through D0 here that gets reverse biased here like this. And uh, when we uh, uh, turn off both of these switches here, you know, if you show the, the magnetizing winding explicitly, uh, else for them here, uh, the current flows through through like this here. And uh, in that case, this current here freewheels through here and uh, uh, you know the voltage across here becomes zero if you assume it to be an ideal diode. So it's very much like a uh, buck converter uh, where you know, Vn times the turns ratio gets applied across here when both the transistors are on and it's equal to zero when both the transistors turn off and uh, the, the magnetizing current here has a path to flow through Vn, which is applied in a negative sense and it causes uh, the flux to come back to zero. So once again, uh, the duty ratio here is uh, limited to uh, 0.5 for these uh, two transistors here. So this brings to the brings us to the end of this uh, segment, uh, where we have looked at switch mode power supplies made up of flyback and forward conversions. Okay, so if you are still watching, uh, you have survived uh, day one, and uh, this is uh, almost 4:30. So we. Uh, stop at this point and then have a good evening and uh, we see you tomorrow morning at 8 30 and we continue with the next modules here okay if yeah. they have any questions they can yeah. email either yeah. of us yeah. Yeah. or yeah. so if you have any questions you can uh, uh, put in the chat box and uh, we will be here early at eight o'clock and uh, we can answer your questions at that time or after we start at 8 30. all right Thank you. Bye bye. Actually, there is one question. Oh, there is one question. Okay. <laughs> discussion of flyback. Mm -hmm. The discussion of flyback. Tomorrow they are saying. Okay. Yeah. So okay. I guess no, no. We we can we can ask answer this question on flyback uh, tomorrow and uh, yeah. you know, whatever else you may you may have. Mm -hmm. So please, uh, uh, you know, certainly bring that up tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye. Stop. Stop. Recording.